Hey, Farzad, thank you again for taking the time. Look, um, I want to get into kind of what we're living through here, but I also want uh, our listeners here to just learn a little bit about you. You've obviously had a very interesting career. You're the founder and CEO of Allidaid. Before that, you were the National Coordinator of Health IT. You've also been an Assistant Commissioner in the New York Department of Health. And you have recently been looking into data on uh, COVID-19. And recently is probably not right. I think you were one of those who sounded the alarm early. You came up with the technique for tracking global pandemics, somewhat of an early warning system, uh, used it with the flu. Can you just explain a little bit uh, uh, about that and, and what that is? Yeah. So most uh, public health surveillance relies on people being diagnosed with a condition, a lab doing a test or a doctor making a diagnosis, and then either the laboratory or the physician making a report to a health department. Uh, But what we realized was that particularly for new diseases, um, you may not see that recognition early on. The lab may not have the test for it, as was the case with COVID. And the physicians may assume that it's something else uh, and not, not understand what, is, what exactly is going on. So the technique that we came up with originally was for bioterrorism, thinking that there may be some uh, massive outbreaks due to bioterror agents and also pandemic influenza. And it simply says, why don't we track not diagnoses, but illnesses, symptoms, and let's see what is happening with the number of people going to the emergency room or going to their doctor or calling an ambulance for difficulty breathing, cough, fever, nonspecific syndromes. And they're nonspecific, but if you apply statistical techniques, cluster detection, temporal spatial scans and so forth, you can actually detect pretty small increases on a citywide level uh, that can be your first indication that there's something going on that needs to then be further investigated. So that collection of getting access to ongoing data streams, applying statistical methodologies, figuring out how to respond uh, and investigate, that field became known as syndromic surveillance and is now something that we dreamt up 20 years ago, Uh, literally 20 years ago, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And really took off after 9-11 and the anthrax attacks, that is now standard. Now that's just part of, there's a third kind of public health surveillance we now do, which is syndromic surveillance. And you're seeing it now more and more uh, in the coronavirus White House briefings every day. They're talking about what's going on with influenza-like illness at the Sentinel ILI and ED syndromic sites and making using that to make real decisions about what's going on uh, in the absence of timely information around what's happening uh, with, the, uh, with the disease. And obviously, as I to do this, you you need to be collecting a lot of data, right? And uh, how are we as a country at collecting the the data you need to actually do this well? Does that exist, and we just aren't using it, or uh, are we also behind on the data collection? The insight, the key insight, was that there's already a lot of data being collected administratively. So. If an ambulance is being dispatched, if a patient is being registered in the emergency room, there's data being collected. And let's just, let's not ask anyone to do anything different than what they're already doing. And let's just tap into that data stream and use it as it is, modify it, do groupings, do natural language processing or whatever. So it's mostly was saying healthcare is becoming electronic in terms of its administrative systems. When you buy something at the pharmacy and it goes beep, that's a transaction. Let's monitor transactions across society. That was the first phase of this. The second phase was, well, heck, we're spending $28 billion to wire up doctors and hospitals. You you recall, you were were kind of overseeing me there (laughs) when you were working with uh, Vice President Biden on on the High Tech Act and, and on the stimulus bill. And you were like, what are we spending this money on, right? What are we doing with it? And one of the things that we spent the money on was making sure that we got better data, Um, not just data collected, but also data transmitted to public health for syndromic surveillance, for electronic lab reporting, for um, immunization. So uh, that data is now much, much uh, cleaner. It's much more clinical and it's much more available. And we now have the vast majority of hospitals in the country reporting daily their emergency room uh, visits to public health. And that has turned out to be the key tool 
in tracking this outbreak. As, as you just said, Farzad, we, we met over 10 years ago uh, when you were the head of uh, ONC, when you were the National Coordinator for Health IT, uh, and I was working over at the White House. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, you have this national government experience, both as the head of ONC and uh, through your time at CDC. Uh, but then you also have heavily local government experience as, you, as the assistant commissioner. By the way, under Thomas Frieden, uh, you know, who has been a very... Uh, vocal voice during the current outbreak uh, when you were at New York City. And so when you think about the role of just foundational public health and uh, pandemic preparedness, uh, how do you see the role of the federal government uh, versus the role of local governments like the New York City Department of Health? And, and where, does, you know, where, does the, where does the magic really lie? And what, what, what do each the federal and the local governments need to do? And where are the bigger gaps? Yeah, I mean, I lived this uh, when I was at New York City and the federal government wanted to basically nationalize this syndromic surveillance. What we pushed was, and um, uh, we created this framework for distributed surveillance, uh, where the data is collected in more or less standardized ways. It's brought together, the results are aggregated, but the line level data stays at the state and local kind of locker. And that's the model that uh, has worked in this, where the CDC set up the technology, they set up the catcher's mitt, they created the analytic tools, they can collate all this information together, but each state and local health department has their locker on this Amazon Web Services infrastructure. That to me is the right model, where the federal government provides support, standardization, visualization, and the ability to knit together all these findings, but fundamentally, the switch is in the hands of the state and local health departments, and yeah. they decide what gets switched. You work with a lot of these practices that are on the front lines and are dealing with not only a healthcare crisis, but a, an economic crisis for them now too. Um, how are they doing? And, uh, and what are they experiencing? Uh, what, what are you seeing out there? They're suffering. I mean, if you think about being a frontline practice, and you can't get masks. Everyone's talking about how, you know, in the ho how bad it is for hospitals and how they're running low. These frontline community primary care practices cannot get their 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 supply chain is broken, and they have people with cough and fever coming into their offices, and they are they want to care for their community, and they're getting infected, and they're going out on quarantine. And they're therefore telling their patients, stay home, don't come into the office, which means, guess what? That their fee-for-service revenue is evaporating, which means, guess what? They're having to lay people off. The healthcare sector was the second largest sector after leisure and hospitality to lose jobs in March during a pandemic. Does that make any sense in the world? No. And that all didn't come from hospitals. It came from outpatient practices. So we are literally hollowing out our frontline primary care practices at a time when we're going to need them the most to be able to do diagnosis and testing and treatment. And we have heroic doctors who are going out there. They're doing parking lot swabs. They're doing porch visits. They're doing home visits. They're doing televisits. They're doing everything they can to keep serving their communities. And they are going out of business and they're getting infected and they are worried sick, not only like all the rest of us about our families and our communities, but also their staff and also their businesses. So it is not a good situation and we're doing everything we can to help not only our 550 practices, but really help carry this message for that the rest of these practices need help too. Farzad, uh, before I let you go here, uh, tell us, tell me two things. One is, uh, on the pandemic side of things, tell me uh, how you see the next uh, few months, the next year, the next two years uh, playing out. The, give me, give me the, the Farzad crystal ball here. So I think we're going to, I think it's working, the social distancing that we all did ourselves. And in, in many ways, the social distancing began with companies deciding to tell people to work from home with conference organizers canceling, with individual individuals saying, I'm like, I am so scared of what's going on and there is no leadership. 
and we're just going to have to figure it out for ourselves. And I think in that haphazard, whatever thing it was, like it worked and, and the leaders followed and then the stay home orders and the closed school orders and all that happened. And I think it worked. So that's good. Um, the, the infection has slowed for sure. And I hope that we can spend the money to reclaim containment, that we can reclaim the ability to contact trace every positive case, identify their contacts, put them into quarantine, and use that to slow the spread and to continue to develop therapies and ultimately vaccines to get us um, protection from this without 40, 50% of the population needing to become infected to get this herd immunity. I think that's gonna, I think that's gonna happen. What I worry about though, is that we are gonna see flare-ups. And what we saw in New York City, I don't know if you realize this, but in there was one week last month where New York City had the most deaths ever recorded in its history. And that includes 1917. Yeah. This is not flu. Right. This is this is a serious threat to any state, any city that takes this lightly. It's going to rip through that city. And we got to be really, really vigilant. And my fear is that we will see more cities who are slow on the uptake or get complacent and it rips through that city. So that's my fear uh, and my hope. Well, hey, Farzad. Uh, first of all, congratulations on all you are doing, and thank you for doing this on a Sunday morning. Uh, I know we are uh, living these lives where weekends and weekdays have started to, you know, blend a little Completely bit, but, um, but really appreciate your time. So thanks again. Namaste. Yeah, namaste. Thanks. <laughs>